I'd like to say uh, a big welcome to Amanda Archibald, who will be welcoming to the Secret Language of Food in November this year in Brisbane. And Amanda, a registered dietitian with um, a huge difference. She brings so much to the table uh, with her knowledge, not just about food and engaging people emotionally with food and getting them excited about changing their diets, but also how it relates specifically to their genes. Uh, and so, um, Amanda, really, you, you talk about focusing on the cells rather than epidemiology. So rather than looking at groups of people and nutrients and so on, you're looking at, at the cells. Can you um, tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, well, I'm allowed to look at the cells because, you know, the foundation of my practice is genetics. You know, so literally you're looking at how somebody's built um, from the cells up. And one of the things we see when we're using a, you know, a really good test is how far offline key cellular processes are. And what I mean by offline is how much genes may be di distorting the signals, um, distorting the pathways, distorting the inform cellular information um, so that when I'm thinking about how you bring somebody back to optimal health, we have to set, we have to really target the cellular processes first. We have to bring things like methylation on online. We have to, you know, tackle oxidative stress headlong and inflammation because they're siblings, right? One begets the other. <laughs> and if yes. we don't remove the sludge from the body, which is induced by emotional stress or environmental toxins and pollutants it doesn't matter what we're trying to achieve in health you know in other words it's like you have to get through the brain fog of the cell and get all those systems purring along really to be able to have a, a systemic uh, brush stroke on the body if you will so yeah. that's why we you know we work from the cell up I feel that epidemiology has served us for a long time, right? It's given us very key directions into or explanations as to the why, you know, why are we seeing this? Why are we seeing that? Um, you know, it's retrospective in so many ways, looking at studies that might explain why do we, you know, have so many women with endometriosis or PCOS or something like that. So it gives us like this retrospective view Regardless of that, when an individual steps into your practice, into your clinic, you're not going to look at epidemiology. You're going to look at the person in front of you and help to reconstruct or redirect their health one cell at a time, one cellular process at a time. So I think this is the age of, you know, truly the cutting edge of functional or integrative medicine. But now we're using genomics as like the icing on the cake, saying this helps you look at the person in front of you instead of like a population-based approach, both of which are important, right? Both inform each other, but this is N of one um, medicine that we're practicing or nutrition science in my case. You know, like I said, I'm gonna show this at the conference mm. that we were all trained uh, somewhere in our careers in nutritional biochemistry, but the way we were trained was awful. And Christine talks about this. We were trained to look at how molecules change, right? Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. The Krebs cycle. We weren't necessarily trained in what these molecules did. We were trained in, you know, how they change throughout a cycle. And so it was this very two-dimensional approach to understanding nutritional biochemistry. So what and so when I kind of stepped into the field of genomics, I went back to how I was trained and said, you know what, it doesn't matter whether you're a doctor, naturopath, chiropractor, dietitian, when you're working with a patient in the back of your mind, you want to say to yourself, what am I trying to achieve through food, you know, or our food and the supplements, particularly a nutrigenomic supplement, what is the pathway I'm targeting? So food translation really is looking at a biochemical equation and saying, what am I trying to achieve? What food um, will help us deliver that equation? So because food is information, whether it's bioactives, whether it's a macronutrient, you know, a, a polyunsaturated fat, for example, or whether it's a bioactive or a cofactor like vitamin or mineral, they all play in, a, in a, an equation that relates to our physiology. So, and I think that's a really important point to understand that, you know, if we're trying to target inflammation, 
in our mind, what are we doing in the immune system? Are we trying to upregulate TH1 or downregulate, you know, the autoimmune response, TH17 response, which is a part of the, you know, GEM protocol. What are we trying to achieve through the food we're recommending to a patient? That's called culinary translation. And when you add in genomics, it's culinary genomics. It's applying mm. the culinary arts to genomic science. Yeah. So I will probably show how we do that <laughs> in the conference. Uh, we, we were chatting earlier about, you know, the difference um, in geographic areas based on, you know, silver depletion and so on. Uh, and uh, But we have people are getting mixes of foods from all over the world, uh, but lots of refined and processed foods. Um, so, uh, and I guess too, there's been a, a cry with, by the largely supplement manufacturing industry that we can't rely on food anymore because of all these things, processing and so on. Um, but my feeling, and I think it's your feeling too, is we must, and in fact, as clinicians, we must let our patients know that food is absolutely essential while well, supplements can be important food is absent so what what are your thoughts there that we can't rely on food anymore well right. i think we just go back to nature you know food is what the body responds to because all the molecules are aligned in a natural matrix that's physiologically compatible with our body i was thinking about this this morning you know and so for example um, food has all the information our body needs. Sometimes we have to push a little bit harder to get to choose foods that have maybe have a little bit more information in them for our body. So, for example, that's where we're talking about, um, you know, cold fatty fish, for example, are going to be an exponentially better uh, value or delivery of EPA and DHA, for example, or capers when we're looking at quercetin. But even mm. when we're looking at a caper, which is just a fantastic fruit, you know, so flavorful um, and so robust, just because it has high concentrations of quercetin doesn't mean to say it doesn't have other nutrients in it, too. It just happens to be exponentially higher in a bioactive we're interested in. But it's probably got plenty of calcium and magnesium, you know, definitely has fiber in there and carbohydrates or what have you. Um, so food has all the information we need in it. Um, and again, it's in a natural format that our body can recognize where supplements can help us, I feel is, and I explain this to my patients is helping to get the gears of your, well, the teeth in the gears of your biochemistry to reconnect. It helps us get our biochemistry back to efficiency. So food can be the leader again. So the two work side by side. Um, but when we're when we're using supplements like medicine, then we may as well be practicing medicine. Um, mm. And so I think we we have to be very, it, let me back up here. The question that we were talking about before, which is what is culinary translation? I answered it by saying, what are we trying to achieve through food? What biochemical pathway are we trying to target? We need to apply the same logic to, if we're gonna use a supplement, how are we going to explain to a patient exactly why we're choosing that supplement for how long and what's it going to do in the body? And when do we drop it? You know, mm, this is yeah. important. And so one of the questions I ask on my intake form for my patients is tell me which supplements you're taking and why. Okay. And I have a lot of patients who are clinicians too, or clients who are clinicians and even with them, they may not be able to say why. Oh, well, mm. I started taking it and I just haven't stopped taking it. I'm like, well, have you achieved your goal with it? What were you trying to achieve with it? And with our patients, we, they be, may be taking sometimes 80 swallows of a supplement and they don't know why they're taking them. They just are. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah, no, very I've experienced, outrageous. Yeah, I've experienced that myself where patients will come in with bags full of oh, stuff, yeah. you know, and, and it can be from a history with a number of clinicians as well as what they've read and, and so what on. What they've read, yes. Yeah. yeah, and one of the big and challenges is is talking about some of them and going, well, actually, you know. 
Yeah. Well, and I think too, you know, we do a lot of testing in the US. I know you do in Australia. Mm. We just seem to do a lot here. And I'm seeing, you know, a lot of my patients are ones like like you seeing that have very complex issues. They're hopping around from doctor to doctor. The more they hop, the more supplements they get. And then they go to the next practitioner who runs yet another micronutrient test. And guess what? They come back deficient. And so I'm sitting there saying it's a moment in time, you know, that that is a snapshot in time. And, you know, if you're taking wheelbarrows, I say wheelbarrows full of supplements, you have no idea what's working. So, but we do know how food works. So, uh, fantastic. Now, Amanda, um, you part of the challenge of a, of a clinician or a dietitian, which you are, or, you know, naturopath, integrative doctor is, is, inspiring people to change their diet i mean it's so easy people get hooked on all the wrong sorts of foods etc so with your approach is there a moment in time when you can see the lights going on with a patient when they recognize yes i can do this and yes i need to do this yeah i i mean for me because my practice is based with genetics first, this is the first time for many people that they've had the opportunity to sit down for maybe an hour and an hour and a half and understand their health issues and their health opportunities through the lens of how they're built because genes don't lie. You know, and when you're able, I'm going to answer your question here, but when you're able to connect the dots by looking at aberrations in their genes that really reflect the person in front of you or who they are, that right there is probably one, one of the most empowering things, or most empowering tools, mm. um, because people right away are engaged. I mean, it's like I, in, in many ways, I don't have to sell them on the next steps because I've been, been able to identify with their journey through their genes. So there's no guesswork. That's, that's what's so potent and powerful. Same with nutrigenomics. There is no guesswork. The only guess what may be to how long or whether you have to titrate up a little bit longer, you know, or push, push harder on those cruciferous vegetables or whatever, but we know exactly what we're doing. And so with genomics, so it, with my scenario, the light immediately goes on after the first mm -hmm. session with the patient, like we're in, I'm in, this is yeah. interesting. You reflected who I am. Thank you for understanding. And what are we going to do next? Um, Brilliant. Yeah. So it's like yeah. you've, got, you've you've shown them, I see you and I, I identify you. with you. Yeah, love it. That's beautiful. Many of the tests that we do for our patients are a snapshot in time, whether it's a measure of their microbiome or whether it's looking mm -hmm. at particular nutrients and their levels in the body. Whereas when we do a gene test, it's it's um it remains constant. And it gives us a far deeper understanding of the patient. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. It's not predictive of diagnostic, but it's informative reflection of the patient, but clinically informative in so, so many ways. It cuts through the, the guesswork. Yeah. Can't wait to hear more of that being unpacked at the conference, The Secret Language of Food. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, thank you.